Okay, my name is Dmitry. Uh, <laughs> I currently work at uh, ING. If it's, <laughs> if it's possible to say it in this uh, <laughs> building. There are many here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know what to tell else about myself. And uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, and uh, I was uh, going to give an extensive talk about uh, iOS serialization, and uh, here is the plan. But uh, I, I gave this talk a week ago uh, in a big conference in Russia, mobile conference, and it took me 50 minutes uh, to uh, tell the, the whole story in Russian, which is my native language. And when I started to rehearse it for this meetup, uh, it turned out that it takes me a bit longer to tell it in English. It was like hour, hour and a half or something. <laughs> so I started to decrease it, to shorten it, remove all the details, examples, but it still was uh, more than one hour. So I decided to stop struggling and just uh, uh, quickly run through the first part, the first uh, uh, three uh, parts of the of the talk and uh, focus on the last uh, last ones because I think they're the most interesting part. So let's start. Uh, serialization, as all of you know, it's the process of translating data structures and uh, uh, object uh, states uh, into a binary format and deserialization is an opposite process and there are basically two uh, main applications of uh, serialization. The first one is data transmission and the second one is uh, data persistence. During this talk, we will be developing a small uh, logistics app, uh, some products, warehouses, uh, to showcase uh, the serialization tasks. Uh, and at the beginning, the app is uh, quite primitive. We have just one screen. Uh, we display the list uh, of uh, warehouses uh, on it, and uh, we receive this list from the, from the backend. Uh, of course, uh, we use JSON as uh, our format uh, of communication to the backend. Uh, and, well, okay. it's the, the most the most popular one. Yes, not of course. We, we will we, we will change it later. Actually, during the presentation, uh, and uh, as we know, uh, the JSON serialization is the first and the, uh, first native class we had uh, to work with JSON uh, in well, Objective C at that time. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, JSON uh, serialization class uh, make, makes a conversion between JSON and uh, specific data structure, as you know. Uh, I will call it foundation model, and basically it's uh, a dictionary or an array with some additional limitation, uh, limitations on the internal data structure. Uh, so we receive our data from the backend, we parse it, we display it, everything works fine until at some point we decided uh, to switch from, uh, well, we decided to introduce our custom classes and parse uh, our uh, JSON into uh, custom classes. And uh, the first challenge here, as all of you can imagine, that uh, in Objective-C we don't uh, have uh, native uh, tools to directly convert uh, JSON into custom models and back. We have to uh, work with a foundation model, uh, which became a kind of intermediate model uh, be between our class and uh, the JSON file. And uh, in pre-Swift era, uh, the community developed uh, two uh, basic uh, way ways to solve this uh, problem. The first one is manual mapping. Uh, I hope most of you did it at some point in time. Uh, we just create a dictionary out of the model, and uh, the other way around, uh, we fill in the model from uh, the, the dictionary. And uh, the second uh, approach is auto mapping when we use Objective C runtime to uh, investigate uh, the, this class structure and to create the foundation model uh, in runtime as we as we work as the code works. Uh, yeah, here are the most popular uh, libraries to do automatic mapping uh, for you. If you don't want to implement uh, the entire code for auto mapping, I did it once and it was a lot of work. Uh, yeah, and uh, NS coding is our first uh, API that we use for uh, serializing the data for, uh, for persistence. And yeah, basically we all know how it works. I just want to mention that NSKID Archiver and NSKID Unarchiver are the only uh, 
existing classes that we have nowadays in foundation which uh, inherits NS coder and not deprecate it. Uh, basically, these are our main coders in NS, coder, NS coding uh, infrastructure. And if our models uh, in, uh, conform to uh, NS coding, uh, the well, serializing, deserializing is a trivial task. Uh, Kate Archiver, by default, uh, serializes data into. Hmm? Sorry? Sorry, Yeah, well. At some point, we switched to Swift, as you could notice. Uh, yeah, and uh, Kader Hiver by default uh, encodes data into the binary format, but optionally can do it in uh, XML. Uh, we skipped uh, another uh, serialization class, uh, which also uh, deals with XML. It was uh, property list serialization. Uh, both of these coders. Uh, serializes data into XML, but uh, these are different XMLs, and we will talk about it. Uh, for instance, let's take uh, an object of a simple class and just uh, serialize it with uh, NS property list serialization. As a result, uh, we'll have such simple and uh, straightforward XML, if it's possible to say it about XML in general. Uh, and if we pass the same object uh, of the same class into uh, KD Archiver, we will have uh, such a huge piece of XML uh, as a resulting file. If we compare the sizes of uh, the files on disk, well, indeed we see that uh, Archiver's result uh, is uh, several times bigger. And actually the reason is that uh, the Archiver encodes a lot of metadata, and this metadata is completely useless for such uh, primitive model that the one we just uh, mentioned, but it's necessary for more complex data structures uh, like object graphs. Uh, the next API I want to mention is Codable. Uh, we got Codable together with Swift 4, and uh, it's supposed to solve most of our issues when, uh, when, using, uh, when uh, serializing uh, objects uh, in Swift. Uh, basically, if uh, well, all the primitive types, uh, I think most of the standard library classes and uh, even several types in Foundation and UIKit already uh, conform, conform uh, to Codable uh, out of the box. And if we want our custom model to conform Codable as well, all its properties uh, should conform Codable. In this case, we have uh, mm, we have uh, compile time, uh, uh, compile time uh, generation of uh, the of the methods uh, of the codable methods. Uh, if uh, the compiler uh, is not able to generate the implementation for us, or if we need to introduce some customization uh, to to this uh, implementation, we can uh, rewrite these methods uh, ourselves. Uh, Codable is a great example of a system designed based on protocols. Uh, almost everything is a protocol there, and uh, among the concrete classes we have these two encoders. Uh, but because of uh, the protocols, uh, the system is uh, quite flexible if you want to ex uh, extend it and uh, introduce some uh, custom uh, coders for custom formats. Back to our app, uh, some of our warehouses are located in the location, located in the, in the locations, in some places with the awful internet, so we decided to uh, decrease the traffic we send between the client and the, and the backend. And we move from JSON to something more compact, uh, for instance, message pack, but it's just an example. Mm, and for this purpose, we just need to uh, create our custom pair of coders, and the rest of the code will just work. Don't need to change anything else. Uh, there are several blog posts uh, about this, uh, yeah, about how to create uh, custom coders. Uh, it's relatively not so difficult. If some of you now think that uh, Codable is a pure Swift native API, uh, I will disappoint you, sorry. Uh, if we uh, get into the source code, we'll see that, for instance, JSON encoder is full of uh, foundation types. Uh, the main job is being done by uh, JSON serialization class, the same class that we used in Objective-C before. Uh, and uh, as a container, we use, uh, well, the, the code uh, basically uses uh, 
uh, NS Mutable Dictionary and uh, NS Mutable Array. Uh, the container uh, is uh, the same intermediate model uh, that we use to uh, code, uh, yeah, to code our data into the output format. If we compare the speed of Codable with some uh, Objective-C APIs, uh, for instance, for a JSON in this case, uh, we can see that it's a bit slower than even the uh, JSON mapping with the uh, runtime class inspection. But I think we all can agree that this difference is negligible and uh, it's nothing comparing to the convenience that we have uh, when using Codable. Uh, this stuff we can skip. Yeah, let's talk about enums. It's much more fun. Uh, in our application, we have a class, uh, the state class, uh, and this class has a property uh, state code. And this property is represented uh, with such an enum. And sometimes we don't need uh, to handle the entire object of the state. Uh, the enum, uh, the, the state code is uh, just uh, just enough for us. Uh, for instance, if we want to uh, store the top selling state. Uh, locally uh, in our app, uh, we might uh, think that we can store just uh, this enum. The, yeah. And uh, everything seems to be fine. Uh, the enum conforms codable. Uh, the compiler without any issue can synthesize the implementation of uh, codable methods. But in the runtime, in runtime we get this error. And to understand what went wrong, we have to remember that under the hood of uh, encoders that we use, uh, in this case it was what property list encoder, uh, under the hood uh, the encoders uh, uses, use uh, the serialization classes from Objective-C and these classes require the top level to be a dictionary or an array. An, or an array. Uh, so we cannot serialize, serialize uh, our enum as well as any other value of the primitive type uh, as it is without uh, wrapping it into some kind of container. And well, we can, uh, for, this, uh, for this case we have actually several different options. We can literally wrap it into some array or dictionary. We can serialize it as a property of uh, a, bigger op a bigger object. In our example, uh, we can serialize the entire state object instead of uh, just uh, enum. We can, of course, implement Codable ourselves manually, or we can use uh, KD Archiver, which, which doesn't have uh, an explicit requirement uh, for containerization. Uh, moving forward, in our app at some point, we introduced the work with uh, barcodes, and we have uh, two types of barcodes, uh, one-dimensional uh, UPS code and two-dimensional QR code. First encodes uh, several numbers, uh, the second uh, encodes a string. So we decided to use enumeration with uh, associated type to model this object. Uh, and we got a bit puzzled uh, when we uh, had to serialize the array of such enumerations to store them locally. Well, of course, uh, at first we just uh, said that it's going to conform to Codable and hoped that the compiler uh, would do the rest of the job, but the compiler immediately uh, tells us that, well, it cannot. Uh, and uh, the, uh, searching the, the reason of this uh, message, uh, we get into the official Swift forum. And there we found out that uh, for the compiler, the resulting structure of uh, this uh, enum, uh, the structure which we're supposed to store, uh, is kind of ambiguous, so it cannot synthesize uh, the, uh, the implementation of the methods, uh, even in spite of the fact that we use only primitive types inside. So, uh, yeah, and one of the Swift maintainers said that they ki kind of uh, wanted to be implemented at some point, but uh, currently it's not clear how to do it, so nothing moves so far. Uh, and we have to uh, write the implementation ourselves, and uh, it's a bit uh, more difficult than it can seem, because we also have to decide uh, which uh, form of data structure we want to store eventually. What do I mean by the form? Uh, for instance, we can uh, store, it, store the data in this form. It uh, looks quite native and logical for us. 
the form when uh, as the top object we store the case of enum and uh, the associated types are its nested uh, metadata. And uh, the alternative option could be the plane structure. When we store everything uh, on the same level, uh, yeah. Uh, and in this case, we don't even need to store the case uh, itself if we have some uh, associated data. Uh, I will explain why. Uh, let's just uh, remember that when we implement Codable ourselves, we, uh, we use uh, internal enum with uh, coding keys. And uh, the question is, how do we pick the keys? And for this structure, we pick uh, a unique, uh, for, for every associated value, we pick unique uh, key in uh, the context of the enum. So uh, by the key, we can easily say which uh, case uh, this enum belongs to. When we encode the data, we just uh, grab all the associated values for the case and uh, store them uh, with the corresponding keys. Uh, but when we decode uh, the, the data, uh, we actually uh, check uh, some random key for each case, uh, each enum case, and uh, when we find the key, we know exactly which case we are going to uh, deserialize. At that point, we retrieve the rest of the keys and uh, we create and return the, the enum. Okay, object graphs. Our application uh, grows, and at some point we uh, found uh, ourselves in the situation when we don't uh, deal with uh, separate objects anymore, but we deal with uh, uh, an entire object graph with uh, tightly coupled uh, objects. And uh, in iOS, we have several different ways to handle object graphs. First of all, of course, Core Data and uh, Realm. These frameworks uh, give us their uh, root classes, uh, root classes for our models. We inherit these root classes and the root class encapsulates all the serialization uh, as well as uh, input output of the data. The second option is SQLite uh, database. In this case, we do the mapping between our uh, custom models and uh, the database rows uh, ourselves or with the help of some ORM. And the third uh, option is uh, serial serialization into uh, the binary file, uh, the, the approach which uh, we've been discussing during this talk so far. Uh, we used, uh, we uh, got used to the idea that the third approach usually is uh, the worst one. But that's not always the case. Let's, for instance, uh, compare serialization to core data with uh, an SCAD archiver. Uh, serialization into the binary file uh, with an SCAD archiver. There is a nice article, uh, it's old but still relevant, uh, at NS Hipster, which uh, actually does uh, the comparison for us. And uh, if we compare these two approaches side by side, feature by feature, we could see that uh, core data beats uh, KDR Hiver almost in every position, actually I think in every position. But uh, if we abstract uh, a bit from uh, these specific features, we can simplify the entire table into this uh, simple matrix. And here, <laughs> the advantage of core data is not so obvious. Let's put it this way. Yeah, of course, it's a joke, but uh, in every joke, there is a part of truth. And uh, here, the truth is that not every project requires all the nice core data features. If somebody remembers, uh, remembers my uh, last talk <laughs> here in Cocoa Heads was about core data. I really love it. Uh, but uh, sometimes we don't need anything. We don't need uh, fetches, sorting, filtering. We don't, don't need migrations. We don't need uh, lazy loading. And from the other hand, uh, our entire object graph can be so small that we can uh, re uh, retrieve, retrieve it into the memory without much effort and uh, use it from there. And we decided that for our uh, current project, that's actually the way to go. So we just, uh, we want to, yeah, quite simple graph, you can see. Uh, we need to serialize it, uh, well, yeah, yeah, we need to serialize it. Uh, for that, uh, we need to traverse uh, the graph node by node and uh, mm, create the piece of binary data out of uh, each uh, single object. 
Uh, when working with graphs, we have to consider that uh, some of them, regardless the size, uh, can be uh, translated into translate can be translated into trees. Uh, that means that the graph can be easily traversed, uh, easily recursively uh, traversed, starting from some root node without any issues. But uh, some graphs, uh, even small ones, uh, cannot be uh, translated uh, into trees because basically they have uh, bidirectional connections or cyclic dependencies. Uh, in this case, uh, we have several complications when traversing the graph. Uh, for, for example, uh, cyclic references. Uh, well, if uh, the coder which we use to traverse the graph doesn't consider cyclic references, uh, at some point it will inevitably uh, go into an infinite loop uh, when following every single reference. Uh, several references to one object cannot uh, screw up stuff when we do serialization, but when we deserialize the graph, uh, if not considered, uh, it will cause to instantiate in several uh, separate objects instead of one, uh, instead of one with uh, several references to it. And conditional serialization is uh, also quite a nice uh, technique. Uh, it's uh, more or less a uh, reflection of uh, the concept of strong and weak references. And the object uh, is uh, serialized into the final archive only if it's uh, somewhere serialized unconditionally. Uh, and the good news uh, is that uh, we have all this stuff covered if we use an SKD archiver. Uh, we don't need to care about these things. And actually that's uh, the metadata which makes the uh, output uh, file so big because yeah, NSK here consider, considers uh, all of these things. Uh, it was NS coding. What about codable? Uh, how does how do our uh, codable coders work with complex graphs? And unfortunately, they don't support this at all. I mean, if we code uh, the, the complex graph with uh, one of these encoders, we will see all these problems that I've mentioned. In the forum, there are several threads uh, dedicated to the topic, and uh, Swift maintainers uh, said that some of the functionality I mentioned was intended to be implemented in the, code of, in the uh, encoders, but they just didn't have time for that. It's uh, in the backlog and will be there uh, in some future. But uh, some features uh, is almost impossible to uh, implement because of uh, some Swift limitations, for instance, limitations uh, for the um, instanti instantiation of the objects. But uh, if we take a look at KD Archiver, we can find that it has some uh, APIs to work with Codable, not uh, just with NS coding. These methods uh, were specifically added uh, together with the release of uh, Codable uh, in Swift 4. And if our complex graph conforms to Codable, it seems to be possible to just take a KD archiver and uh, serialize it easily. But if we do that, we will uh, see all the issues uh, with the infinite loops and several objects when we intended to have one object. And it can be confusing because I just uh, told you how great KD Archiver handles all the complex graphs. But as usually the answer is in the source code. If we take a look at the implementation of uh, one of these methods uh, for uh, handling Codable, we can see that part of the job is being done by property list encoder. And uh, I've just explained that property list encoder cannot handle uh, complex graphs. So the entire, uh, the entire thing uh, breaks at the first stage. Uh, and as a result, uh, we, uh, we cannot uh, serialize uh, complex graph uh, in the Codable infrastructure at all. What are the obje uh, options we have to do it uh, in Swift in general, not talking about Codable specifically? First of all, uh, good old Objective-C APIs. They work uh, in Objective-C in Swift. Uh, we just need to implement an S coding. Not an easy task, but we can use the help of some uh, third-party code, code generators if we need it. 
The second option is to extend existing uh, coders uh, with missing functionality. We can uh, create some extensions or um, additional layer, layer of abstraction. Uh, we can create our own pair of coders and uh, going this way we uh, not only solve uh, the issues, uh, the, the complications of the co complex graphs, we uh, will also get uh, compile time uh, generation of the codable code out of the box. Of course, this approach is the most time consuming. And of course, we can uh, find some third party library. There are several uh, to solve uh, these problems for, for Swift uh, models. Let's talk about the UI. Uh, our app is getting bigger and bigger. We already have uh, dozens of screens and uh, quite complex use cases. And at some point, uh, for a seamless user experience, we decided to store the current screen uh, the user visits uh, to be able to retrieve it uh, and show it uh, in case when the app is being killed by the system in the background ground quite, uh, well, typical situation, as we know. Uh, there are several uh, approaches uh, for that task. Uh, the simplest one is just to store the screen type and uh, when the app is uh, relaunch, uh, when the app relaunches, recreate the screen and put it into the main window. Uh, of course, in this case, we lose all the navigation and uh, in case the, the, the current screen is somewhere in the end of the use case, we cannot uh, uh, retrieve the entire navigation stack and user cannot get back to the start screen. To uh, preserve uh, the navigation, we can store the path to the current screen uh, as kind of a deep link and uh, when we retrieve the link, uh, we uh, can recreate uh, this screen by screen and put them into navigation controller. This way we can emulate uh, the, the, the navigation stack. And the th uh, third option is to serialize uh, and store the entire object graph of UI elements, but not just UI elements. Uh, we also need to serialize uh, some corresponding uh, data models. For instance, if we serialize a uh, navigation controller, we also serialize its uh, navigation stack. If we serialize some screen, we also serialize its uh, view model. So this way we can retrieve everything uh, when, the, when the app relaunches. If we take a look at uh, the UI graph of uh, some uh, separate screen, uh, we might see that although it looks a bit like a tree, it's actually a complex graph because of these uh, bidirectional references. Uh, so we have to consider all the complications uh, when uh, serial all the complications of the complex graph when serializing uh, the, the, the UI uh, the graph of the UI objects on screen. So out of these three approaches I mentioned, we can uh, work with uh, last uh, two ones because the number one doesn't fit our requirements. But uh, both of these uh, approaches, number two and number three, uh, needs a lot of code to be implemented. And not everybody knows, but uh, in UIKit we already uh, have uh, the mechanism uh, for that purpose and actually this mechanism uh, follows the third approach from our list. Uh, it uh, serializes and stores the uh, UI graph uh, together with some uh, data models that we specify ourselves. And why am I telling you all of this about this approach? Uh, mostly because under the hood it uses uh, NSK archiver and NS coding interface. Uh, which, uh, well, which tell, tells us that that's actually uh, an SK archiver uh, is a great coder to work with complex graphs. Just an example. The API of this approach is quite simple. Uh, yeah, that's the, the, the method uh, where we specify which uh, data. It's the method which is implemented inside the view controller and it's being called by the UI kit and here we specify which uh, uh, model, uh, which parts of, parts of the model we want to serialize together with the, uh, the view controller. Uh, so, as I said, it's a good example of serialization of uh, a complex graph, but uh, as uh, an approach to solve uh, this very practical uh, task, uh, well, I personally have some complaints uh, uh, to it, to this API. 
Uh, first of all, it works perfectly only until you start uh, initializing some objects in code, not from storyboards. At this point, something breaks. Uh, then uh, that's a really great thing that uh, almost all of this code is implemented inside the UA, inside UA kit, uh, but if we need, we don't have any possibility to do some customization. And uh, we can notice the parallel logic of uh, object uh, in initialization. Uh, what I mean by this uh, is that uh, uh, with this API, we initialize some UI view controllers, views, and some corresponding data. Let's call it UI state. Uh, but uh, the, the rest of the object, uh, the rest of the object, the rest of the apps, uh, still supposed to be instantiated from the regular uh, callbacks like app did finish launching or something like this. And uh, we have uh, two independent uh, flows, and it's not clear how to connect uh, the objects. Uh, from uh, one uh, flow to objects to another flow. Okay, last but least, uh, let's compare NS coding and codable in terms of the approaches itself, not uh, in terms of comparing just uh, protocols. Uh, let's answer the question, can we consider codable as improved version of NS coding for Swift, of course. First of all, uh, let's mention once again, uh, one more time that uh, both these approaches uh, share the same uh, mechanics. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, models, uh, the models uh, implement the methods of the protocols. We uh, pass the coders inside the, the models and the models specifies how they put and retrieve data to and from the, from the coder. Uh, as I mentioned, Codable uh, is easier to extend in case we need uh, some custom uh, coders for custom formats uh, because it's based on protocols and NS coding uh, based mostly on uh, inheritance. We have NS coding protocol, but NS coder is an abstract class uh, that we have to inherit. Uh, in the NS coding system, we have uh, the only uh, Coder uh, NSK archiver, and uh, it uh, it's being used only for uh, persistence. Uh, and in the codable system, from the other hand, we have uh, at least two coders uh, out of the box, and one works uh, with the JSON, another one with a list. Uh, Codable has code generation in compile time, NS coding doesn't, so we have to implement lots of uh, code ourselves or with the help of some third party generators. But NS coding has uh, the, the coder to handle complex graphs and Codable doesn't. Uh, with languages, I think it's, it's clear. Uh, let's mention that there are, well, uh, in Foundation and UA Kit, almost uh, all the classes, I think all the classes actually conforms uh, NS coding, but just few of them conforms uh, codable. In some cases, it's not necessary, but in, in other cases, we might need to implement uh, codable even for um, classes from uh, Foundation, for instance, ourselves, is, if needed. And again, uh, the speed, uh, this uh, graph is for uh, KD archiver, uh, we use it uh, for NS coding, we use it for codable, we see that codable is slower, we already, uh, we already discussed uh, why, why so. So the, the speed is the, the last uh, point in this table. Basically, uh, I wanted to say that uh, Swift team uh, works really hard uh, to improve codable and to make it cover all the possible uh, cases for serialization. Uh, at least for Swift. Mm, and uh, at some point, I think it can replace uh, NS coding, but so far we can say uh, we are not there yet. Uh, yeah, and basically, all these APIs I've been talking about are just tools uh, for different use cases, and uh, knowing all of this and uh, the rest of the information about them, we just need to use uh, the proper to tool for proper case and Everything will be okay, I hope. Thanks for your attention. Sure. Uh, I have two questions. Thanks for the talks. Yep. Really, uh, like, uh, very always good to, to test what, what your thinking is, like to test the speeds and stuff like that. Uh, 
I must say the serialized problems you have with uh, circlic, uh, circlic references. Yeah. With court, used core data, you probably didn't have that. So you encounter a lot of problems because you didn't want to encounter another problem. You didn't want to learn a thing that was already established technology. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course, we, we could use core data, but uh, as I said, it's not always the easiest way. I mean, it could solve the uh, yeah, it could solve the uh, cyclic uh, dependencies, but it could uh, bring us more issues. Yeah. And well, it's up to us to decide. It's, of course, it's about it's about trade-offs, right? So exactly because you see, we have a simple graph, and I saw your graph. Okay, looks like. A a case for core data, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could sort of draw it in core data. Well, yes, of course, we could store it with core data, you know, within core data, and uh, it's also a valid option, but it's just out of the scope of, course, of this talk. Yeah, uh, the second question, you had, at the beginning you mentioned something about message pack, because JSON was too, uh, too, too big. Yeah, message pack is a bit, a, bit, a bit smaller. But if you use JSON and then use GSIP for the, for, the, for the data transmission, which is like a standard thing to do in... Uh, message sending of the internet. Is, that small, is message spec smaller? Is it I actually didn't compare them. I just know that there are several, well, you can easily implement your own binary format and pack the data as tight as you as you want. Mm -hmm. And it will be smaller than the JSON. Uh, it was actually, it was just an example that if we need some other format, we can easily switch mm -hmm. to, the, to, to this. Okay. No, I thought you, had, you, you, you specifically wanted to use message spec and I was just interested in what's, what's uh, No, I said it's just, just an example of some binary format which, uh, which a bit smaller than JSON. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you.